Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts. I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today, we'll be discussing a case where a 69-year-old woman went missing from a department store during a trip up the coast of Maine with her husband. During the initial stages of the search for this missing woman, most circumstances surrounding her and her husband's trip didn't seem totally outlandish. But as time goes on and additional information is uncovered, you'll question everything you thought from the beginning. Today's case is about the disappearance of Virginia Douglas. Virginia Douglas was born in Medford, Massachusetts in 1919. At the time our story begins, she was 69 years old. She met her husband, Frank Douglas, when they were both working together at State Street Bank. The couple married in 1942 when Virginia was 23 and Frank was 24. Later on in life, they bought a home on Fallen Road in Lexington, Massachusetts and grew their family. I did try and find exactly when they bought their house, but I was unsuccessful in my search on that. But regardless, they had three children, two girls, Marilyn and Virginia, who went by Ginny, and one son who I honestly can't quite tell what his name is. There are a lot of articles back in the 80s that stated his name was Frank Douglas Jr., but more recently, his name has been reported as Doug. So (laughs) (laughs) I know I was a little confused. So for... The sake of not confusing our listeners, I'm going to call him Doug so that we don't confuse him with his dad. Maybe he was like Frank Douglas. Frank Doug Douglas Jr. Oh, geez. Right? It was just so weird, but like yeah. all the update articles are Doug. Maybe that's like his nickname, but it's weird that they would put that in an article. Yeah, multiple. Yeah, that's weird. It's very strange. So we'll just call him Doug. That's what we're going to go with. Dad is Frank. Son is Doug be a mean trick to play on your kid to call him Doug Douglas. (laughs) Honestly. (laughs) So Virginia's husband, Frank, had continued to work for State Street Bank for a while, roughly 35 years, and he ended up as the VP of commercial lending for the bank. However, just before he retired, he switched jobs to work for New England Merchants Bank, and then in 1983, he retired from New England Merchants. While Frank was working, though, Virginia tried to keep herself busy, and she even worked with the elderly at one point. She seemed to be an avid gardener as well and enjoyed spending her time out in her yard, which I kind of inferred a little bit just based on what I've read about her. Now, let's fast forward to 1988. Ginny, Frank and Virginia's daughter, was living at home with them in Lexington, Massachusetts while working as an airline hostess, as she'd recently gotten a divorce, so I think that's why she was living with her parents. Their other daughter, Marilyn, was living in Manchester, New Hampshire at the time, and I'm not entirely sure where Doug was living then. But anyway, during the evening hours of Thursday, September 1st, 1988, Virginia and Frank were spending their day at home, but then spontaneously decided to hop into their 1987 dark blue Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme to make a spur-of-the-moment trip up to Bar Harbor, Maine. I've seen it reported that the couple did enjoy traveling, even though it was a bit strange the trip was so out of the blue, but it wasn't completely unlike them. And also, it was a Labor Day weekend, so they could have made the decision to leave that night to avoid traffic. Yeah, of course. If you want to go to Bar Harbor for the fucking weekend, you got to try and avoid traffic. What are you from, Boston? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Le- I, I think hear- Lexington's close to Boston. Well, but. when I think Bar Harbor, that's like, I imagine somebody with a Boston accent just being like, ah, we're going to Bar Harbor. <laughs> All right. You know? That's one way to look at it. <laughs> so the drive up to Bar Harbor from Lexington would be about 283 miles total, which should have taken them roughly four and a half hours to drive. The trip was just going to be for the weekend, so nothing crazy. Now, that Thursday night, I believe they left in the early evening hours and drove about halfway to their destination, which was about 115 miles, and they stopped to stay the night at the South Portland Motor Inn to rest up and then finish the last leg of their trip the following morning. I'm already weirded out. Yeah, it's, it's a little strange. It's a four strange. and a half hour drive. Yes, you but they left. two hours to take a nap? She was More 69. Nap. He was 70. Uh, Maybe. Uh, I mean, if they left late at night they left or in, early evening. Yeah, I've seen it anywhere between like 5 and 8 o'clock at night, so you oh. never know. They probably wanted to sleep. Who leaves at their bedtime? 
<laughs> not me. <laughs> Except for the other night when you made me leave at 10 o'clock at night. And it was a great night, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, but it's not like me. Mm-hmm. All right. Anyway. It's reported that the next morning, Virginia and Frank had breakfast together at a friendlies that was close by to the motor inn that they'd stayed at the night before. It's entirely unclear what they did after this, like during the later morning hours and early afternoon on Friday, September 2nd. But at some point, they did get back into the car to make the final half of the drive up to Bar Harbor. Now, roughly around 5 or 5.30 p.m. that same evening, they'd made their way up to Belfast, Maine, which was about two hours away from Portland, where they'd stayed the night before. It's a little odd to me that they'd driven now like three and a half hours and they were only in Belfast, which is still like an hour and a half away from Bar Harbor. So it kind of seems like their trip was taking a little bit longer than expected. But who knows? Maybe they were just slow drivers. Well, you said they're old. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like maybe they're <laughs> going below the speed limit and Sunday taking drivers. their time. Yeah. So Sunday drivers on a Thursday and Friday. Exactly. <laughs> but regardless of all that, around this time, 5 or 5.30, Virginia had to use the restroom. So she and Frank stopped at a Rennie's shopping plaza located at the intersection of U.S. Route 1 and Main Route 3 in Belfast, Maine. It's reported that Virginia got out of the car, left her purse on the front seat, and walked into the department store. Frank stayed in the car and waited for his wife. However, after only about five-ish minutes, he decided to head into said department store, which it does appear that he did go into the same one that Virginia went into. And I guess Frank went into the store to buy some paper cups, which is just such a strange thing to me to buy on a road trip. But I'll go with it. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what I could use right now? A paper cup. <laughs> it's so strange. When I yeah. first read that, I was like, paper cups? What are you doing with them? If you're going to get paper cups, I mean, what are you going to put in them? My question exactly. Maybe they packed the soda, but they didn't pack the cups possible. All right. So we'll give him the benefit of the doubt there. But before he left the car to head into the store, he was thinking about Virginia and if she were to come out of the store while he was in there. And he didn't want her to be surprised if, you know, she came back and he wasn't at the car. So he wrote a note for her and left it on the steering wheel. The note he left read as follows, quote, Jin, use hide a key. I've gone to get some stuff in the big store, end quote. Use hide a key? So Correct. there must be like a key hidden somewhere on the car? Probably. And what makes me think like this is even weirder, like your wife just went in to go to the bathroom. It is so important that you get these paper cups immediately <laughs> yes. that you have to write a fucking note for. It's so strange, isn't it? That's, yeah. All right. We're Bizarre. off to a great start. Mm -hmm. So when Frank came out of the store after purchasing said paper cups, he noticed that Virginia still wasn't back from her restroom visit. Odd, but he stayed and waited for another 15 minutes and hoped she'd come out soon. But more and more time continued to pass, and Virginia still wasn't coming out of the department store. Frank was definitely worried at this point, and he headed back in to check on his wife. He searched the store and even asked employees to call for her over the loudspeaker, but nobody could locate Virginia Douglas. Finally, around 6.45 p.m., Frank reported his wife missing. And if you're anything like me, you're already curious as to why it may have taken him so long to call authorities. Spoiler alert, I don't have the answer, but I do think it's strange that she supposedly went into this store no later than 5.30 p.m. And at a minimum, an hour and 15 minutes went by before authorities were alerted of her disappearance. I mean, I think I've already tried giving him the benefit of the doubt a little bit with the paper cup situation. But let me give a little bit more benefit of the doubt here. Let's say he waited you know, it was five minutes. He went into the store. He got the paper cups, came back out. She wasn't there. Waited another 15 minutes. All right. So he probably didn't go back into the store to search for his now missing wife until six, right? Probably. Maybe he really thoroughly checked the store. Maybe the employees really tried to find her. Well, it's a shopping center, too. So yeah, maybe she went to another store. So he I could see like an hour and a half. He's looking around for her or whatever. Yeah, it just seemed like a little bit long. Like, I feel like I don't know if it were me, I would have felt like a little more worried a little sooner, but. Me too. I mean, if you had gone in to use the bathroom somewhere and you didn't come out for like 10, 15 minutes, I would have went in. I would have talked to the people that were working there and mm -hmm. would have been like, hey, did you see my wife come in? Did you see her leave with somebody or. Yeah. Whatever. So I could see why you think it's odd. Back in the day, we're talking 88. They're older. I guess. I mean, I don't know. I think it's just a little strange, the whole scenario, but I'm always the one who's like trying to figure out time frames and like mm -hmm. why does this seem so long but 
I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I am. Yeah. I think it's fair to give him the benefit of the doubt at this point. Mm -hmm. But it is weird. Like when you add in the whole paper cup situation and mm. leaving the note, it's just uh, not typical behavior. Yeah. Agreed. But either way, authorities responded to the department store and were now working to locate the missing woman who was described as 110 pounds, five feet, two inches tall with gray hair. It's also reported that Virginia was last seen wearing a dark blue skirt with a light blue top or blouse. Now, authorities were immediately all over the case, and at the same time, Frank was too, because he was rounding up as many family members and friends as he could to come up to Belfast to assist in the search for her. Which is hours away, though. Exactly, but he's calling people, and he's asking them to come up and help that weekend, so. Trying to show initiative to cover your tracks, Mr. Mm -hmm. Frank? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But like nowadays, mm -hmm. you'd have a silver alert going out. Correct, yes. You don't have that stuff though, back then. Nope, unfortunately not. So police were searching the area with cadaver dogs as well as aerial equipment. And they'd also made dozens of police departments, quote, up and down the New England coast, aware of Virginia's mysterious disappearance. Also, the area that everyone was searching seemed to be pretty heavily wooded, like behind the shopping plaza. So... I think that's why they were like bringing in, you know, all this aerial equipment and they had the dogs and they were like, you know what? There's no way we can just like walk through a field arm in arm. It's like very heavily wooded. So. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, if they're bringing in the dogs and stuff, hopefully they went over to the car. Here's her purse. Take a sniff of that and mm -hmm. then try to kind of track her through just to get a rough idea of where she may have gone to. Exactly. So not only were authorities and their teams working to try and locate Virginia, but so was this new team that Frank had hired to assist in the search as well. At first glance, it certainly seems like Frank is sparing no expense or time or energy to try and find Virginia. And the searches of this area that took place as well between both his team and authorities spanned over four days. But even after both teams had exhausted their search efforts, specifically in that area, there was not one single sign of Virginia Douglas. So people that worked in the store, I'm sure they were interviewed. We're getting there. Okay. Yep. Now, simultaneously, as these searches of the woods were going on, authorities also reviewed the Douglas's Oldsmobile Cutlass that had been left in the Rennie's parking lot for days after Virginia had gone missing. Authorities did take some items from the vehicle, but they would not confirm what those were or why they were being taken, other than stating for the press, quote, we took some items we want to examine, end quote. No shit. <laughs> Shocker on that one, right? <laughs> right. And also, just based on some reporting on this case, it appears as though the car was intentionally left in the lot for those few days after Virginia disappeared, just in case she came back, she would find it there. Frank even left additional notes for her so she would know what was going on if she'd made her way back. Seems like this whole note-leaving thing might have been like a common thing between the couple, so I don't know if it's totally out of the ordinary or it was like something they did regularly. I don't know, man. Like, leaving the car there... What, is she going to stumble out of the bathroom stall and be like, oh, thank God the car's still here like <laughs> days later? They called it, it was so weird when I was researching this, like there were a couple articles that called it a vigil. A vigil? Yeah, it was like a vigil is like, like candles and stick them all over the car. I have no idea. It was very strange. It was like this pillar. Like if it were anything, it'd be like it's a pillar of safety, like something that she would know and be comfortable with or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, if she came back out or if, or if she was in the woods or somewhere else, you know. And I assume they probably left the hide a key on there. That way, if, say, somebody had abducted her and she escaped and she got back to that spot, she could find the hide a key, get in the car and drive to somewhere safe. Yeah, that would make sense. I'm not entirely sure, but I, I would assume so. Mm -hmm. Weird. Yeah. So there were three more notes left for Virginia outside of the original one that I read for you before from when he went into the store originally before she was even missing. So I'm going to read each one for you now. The first stated, quote, where are you? Stay here at the car if I'm not back. Gone looking for you again, end quote. The second note stated, quote, Jin, I have gone to McDonald's. Should be back by 1.40 p.m. sat, end quote, meaning Saturday. Jin, I've gone to McDonald's. The McRib is back. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. <sighs> be oh back God. soon. Right. And finally, the third and last note left stated, quote, Mum, call 338-2740, end quote. Now, that number was one that Frank and his family had set up for, like, information, kind of like a tip line in case, you know, anybody were to call in. So it wasn't like some random number he was just leaving on the car. It was like, if she's found and if 
or if she gets back to the car somehow and she finds that and she calls the number, like they're going to know right away that she's there type thing, as you be, say. <laughs> <laughs> I might be getting ahead of myself, but does she have any like uh, diminished mental capacity? Like was she on set, early onset dementia, Alzheimer's or anything like that? We're going to get there. Okay. You're asking a lot of questions just before we're about to get into them. So That's always the way it goes. I know? know. I know. So as we move forward, I do want to say that there was a lot of information that came out in the first week, week and a half-ish on this case. And it actually seems like the majority of the information in general comes out during this time period. And I'm not going to go in like any particular order of what comes out when because it's honestly very jumbled in reporting. So we're just kind of going to work through each piece of information that came out individually and we'll kind of just work through them together. It all came out like in a general time, though. Exactly. It was like the first week or two, pretty much within Mm -hmm. the this time frame. So it's not like I'm telling you anything first because it has more importance than something Mm -hmm. else or anything like that. All right. All right. So at first, like first few days first, the family and authorities did seem to be on the same page with, I guess, like the options of what they believed could have happened here. And those three theories that they called them that they were working off of were, quote, A, she absconded for some reason known only to her, B, she became suddenly disoriented, or C, somebody absconded with her. All three seem unlikely in the extreme, end quote. But then things kind of change a smidge, and I started seeing something reported on in terms of option B, her becoming disoriented. It seemed like the family was not exactly on board with this option. The Boston Globe reported the following about Virginia. The article stated, quote, At 69, Virginia Douglas is fit, possessed a keen sense of direction, and is not inclined to wander, according to family members. She's in good health and has never had a moment's disorientation, said Douglas, a retired Boston banker. There is no conceivable reason why she did not come back, end quote. Her husband also went on to describe their marriage and how she'd have no real reason to want to leave her life behind. He told the Boston Globe, quote, We are best friends. I give her breakfast in bed every morning. You couldn't imagine all the things that we do together, end quote. So that kind of answers my question then. Exactly. You you were just a smidge too early with it. So they're thinking A, B, or C. A, she fled by herself. B, she lost her mind essentially and Mm -hmm. was disoriented. Mm Mm-hmm. And C, she fled with perhaps a secret lover or friend. Or somebody could have abducted her. That's how I would kind of look at option C in my mind. But at, at this point, the family's not on board with option B. Right. But investigators were still going to work every angle because that's their job. And it's not like they're not on board with B because they don't think it could happen. Mm-hmm. It's like there's no medical history of something happening like that. Exactly. So it's not just like them being in denial. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, things can happen. You could have like no symptoms of something and then, you know, an illness just magically appears. Totally possible. But just based on everything everyone has said about her, she's Mm -hmm. in like really great health. Mm -hmm. She seems to be perfectly capable of handling herself. And nothing seemed out of the ordinary to alert at least her husband who was with her to say something possibly could have happened. He's like, no, there's no way. So they drove a fairly nice car for the time. Mm-hmm. Um, did she wear expensive jewelry? I mean, he seemed to be well off. He had a high up bank job. Mm-hmm. I mean, they seem to have like a fair amount of money. I don't think they were like crazy rich or anything, but mm-hmm. yeah. Just trying to think of reasons why somebody would want to take her. Yeah, it's weird. And I mean, it's not like a young child. No. Nope. Or it's not like, you know, uh, an adolescent or late teens, early 20s female. It's a 69 year old woman. Yeah, it's very it's it's very strange circumstances. Like the second I started researching this case, I was like, this is not computing not in my mind. Yeah, it's just not it's not typical at all. So I was very intrigued by it. So mm-hmm. let's move along and we'll get into a little bit more here. Now, in terms of things that are weird about Virginia's disappearance, other than literally everything, but more specifically, it's the whole situation of her leaving her purse behind. That just doesn't make sense to me. I was going to say something about it, Mm -hmm. but I was also like, well, her husband's staying in the car, you know, whatever. But it's like, when does a woman leave her purse behind? And like, when you're going to the bathroom, you always take your purse. Maybe you're going to look in the mirror. You're going to touch up your makeup or whatever. Maybe you need something from the purse. Maybe you're walking through the... Are you reading my script? No. (laughs) Literally, I was like, 
I mean, for me as a woman, that thing's literally always coming with me regardless of where I'm going and whether I need anything from it or not. Right. I'm going to bring it just in case I need something that's in it. You're going into the department store. You're going to pass so many things that you might want to buy. How many clothing items could you pass <laughs> by that you're like, I need that right. and I don't have my purse now? I just thought it was a little strange. But come to find out, it's even weirder because I guess she had this issue with her eyes. Like, they were chronically dry. So she had these special eye drops that she used upwards of four times a day. But she left those behind in her bag. And along with the left behind eye drops, she also left all of her credit cards as well as over $100 in cash. So all in all, just based on this piece of information, I think we can now go back to those three theories that authorities were talking about and rule out option A. Because why would she have absconded on her own without her personal belongings? I see where you're going. She wouldn't run away while leaving all this stuff in the car. She yeah. could have easily just taken her purse. Or mm-hmm. Her husband would have thought nothing of it. Exa- no one would ever think anything of it. You think something <laughs> of it when you leave it in the car. Right. That's my thing. It's like, it doesn't matter what was in the purse. Mm-hmm. Like, th- that has no weight what was in the purse. Yeah. It's either she would take it or she wouldn't take it. It's like a security blanket. Right. I feel naked when I don't have it with me. And I'm sure everyone can agree, like, if you don't have your phone, mm-hmm. you feel your weird. Phone or your wallet or mm-hmm. anything. So it's like... You have your phone wallet keys. You tap your pockets before you leave I the house. before I leave. Exactly. So, like, right. not grabbing your purse just feels foreign. Yes. And I agree, like, if she was going to run away, she would have just taken it with her. Mm-hmm. It was weird from the get-go, and I was very surprised that you didn't mention it, and I put it in there because this is exactly what happened. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, ooh, is he going to spoil it really early? (laughs) But I'm glad you didn't say anything about it now because, you know, this is the flow of the story. Right. (laughs) But It helps aid in the storytelling of it, but Mm -hmm. it immediately triggered in my mind, like, thinking, why is she leaving her purse in the car? I think most people would think like that. Yeah. So. And the fact that you made mention of it, it's like, you could have glossed over that and not said anything about it and mm-hmm. then been like, oh, but she left it in there. But it's but a part of the story. That, yeah. yeah, but when you say that, it's weird. And then you think, all right, now Frank's going to go in and buy his fucking paper cups. Mm-hmm. Now her purse is left leave in, the purse car? in the car. Unless he brought somebody, it in. Ready for somebody to just break the window and steal the purse. Yeah, I don't know. So that's why just And find from... the hide key and steal the fucking car. <laughs> Drew, he left the thing right on there. Right, it's on know? the steering wheel. You look in, you can read that yeah. they've got a hide key now. <laughs> it just makes me think like, the only hide a key I've ever seen are like those fake rocks with the yeah. false bottom. Mm-hmm. Is like a fake rock just sitting on the dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> but how can you get to it? It's in the car. It's like on top of the wheel well. He just put it there like yeah. when he was going in. <laughs> I wonder what this rock is here for. <laughs> but to go back to what we were just saying about how that kind of ruled out option A now, then what does that leave us with? We just ruled out option B about being disoriented. We ruled out option A about her leaving on her own. So now that's only leaving option C that authorities probably more than likely are working off of now. And that was that she absconded with somebody else, whether that be deliberate from her side or if somebody abducted her. Right. And I think also I want to solidify like almost ruling out option B because say she became disoriented. This 69 year old woman's not going to be wandering around with nobody noticing. And they're searching so much. You would find her. I feel like you would find her. If she was like on her way to the bathroom and then just like something went wrong and Mm -hmm. she just started wandering and then she still, she was like walking down the street. Mm -hmm. It's not like that's going to go unnoticed because they're going to have that look in their eye and that kind of fish out of water. I don't know where I am. Very confused. Yeah. So it's not like. And she's already somewhere where she's not normally. She's not in her hometown. She's in another state. Right. So you would think that. If our only options are these three, C is the most likely of them because the other two are pretty well ruled out. Agreed. Now, remember, as we keep going, we're still working in terms of the early days of the investigation at this point. So within the first, you know, week or so. From the start, authorities were talking to witnesses and more specifically, like you mentioned before, John, employees of the department store at Rennie's Shopping Plaza to see if any of them had even seen Virginia in the store. A few did mention to police that they remembered seeing her, but were unfortunately unable to give any real concrete details. Another employee had even mentioned that they'd seen a woman matching Virginia's description walking west along Route 3, roughly two hours after she was said to be last seen in the store, which, remember, was reported at approximately 5.15. So then the sighting would have been probably somewhere between 7, 7.30, 
And also, if you didn't remember, the department store was located at the intersection of Route 1 and Route 3, so seeing her along Route 3 wasn't totally out of the question. But the thing I find to be completely off base here in this whole sighting in general is the time frame. Authorities were already on scene at this point after Virginia had been reported missing. So how would she have been missed by police, but somehow an employee saw her walking along Route 3? Well, I wouldn't rule that out in its entirety. Tell me why. Because life is stranger than fiction. It fucking happens. Like, how many cops initially responded to the department store? Probably not tons of them. Probably one. I guess, maybe. And what if he was coming from the opposite direction on Route 3? And she was walking west and he was coming from east. You know, he would have gotten to the intersection and pulled into the parking lot and talked to Frank. But I think if this employee truly did see her, Mm -hmm. it could kind of lend to the idea that maybe B did happen. Potentially, but it seems like authorities weren't really on board with either of these supposed sightings of her. The one on Route 3 and the one from the store. The Boston Globe reported what investigators stated regarding this. It reads, quote, Weaver said it is difficult to verify even these sightings because this lady has a very common appearance. Several other people in the shopping center told authorities they thought they had seen Virginia Douglas, but the times and circumstances of these reported sightings led police to believe the people are mistaken, end quote. I mean, I think that is absolutely true, that she had a common appearance because back in 88, A lot of the women probably looked the same with the similar haircuts Mm -hmm. and similar styling and everything, you know? Yeah, I mean, she had gray hair. People her age probably had gray hair. So I can see what he's saying about a common appearance and Mm -hmm. people can look similar to others and then you can get confused about those sightings. Over the coming weeks, additional sightings did come into police, but none seemed to hold any weight and Virginia was still missing. At first, the investigation appeared to be pretty much solely focused in the Belfast main area, as that's where Virginia disappeared from. However, authorities in Lexington, Massachusetts, were made aware of the circumstances, and they went to check the couple's fallen road home just to confirm Virginia hadn't made her way there, which certainly didn't seem very likely, but of course you can't rule it out. It's not a poor decision to look over there, though. No, of course not. But you have to think, if she got home, she's going to call a relative or a family member or something. Absolutely, and authorities did check, and unfortunately, as I'm sure you could have guessed, Virginia was not there either. Now, also, still working in that time frame of the first week, investigators also went to the South Portland Motor Inn, which had been the motel that Virginia and Frank had stayed in the night they drove up from Lexington towards Bar Harbor. The individual working that night was able to positively identify Frank Douglas as having been there and as the one who checked into the motel. However, there was no confirmation whatsoever that Virginia had been there with him. But, of course... She could have just been waiting in the car or outside while Frank took care of the payment, all that good stuff. Right, because you got to think you're not walking into a big lobby and walking to an elevator from there. If you're talking to a motel, mm-hmm. it's probably the front desk area where you're talking to them while you're standing outside and it's just a little glass window. Yep. And then you get your key and then you walk down the the length of the The building. It's building. like an extra long ranch house. Right, <laughs> like- and then find... Your room. Your room. So she could have been waiting outside. She could have been in the car. She could have been grabbing the luggage from the trunk. Who knows? Mm -hmm. So totally not weird, at least to me, that she wasn't seen at the motel. Right. Me either. All right. So now authorities also go to the Friendly's location. The two had supposedly had breakfast at that Friday morning, which, remember, was September 2nd, the same day she went missing. One of the employees told police that they had seen both Frank and Virginia eating breakfast there that morning. But... What's weird is that investigators apparently also thought this sighting of the couple was, quote, tainted. The reason for that seems to be because of the following statement from the witness, which was reported on in the Boston Globe. It reads, quote, I told him I remember Mr. Douglas and I remember a woman with him. But police asked me if I was 100 percent sure and I had to say no. I was 100 percent sure it was Mr. Douglas, but only 75 percent sure about her, end quote. Does Frank have a very distinct face or a very distinct appearance? I can't appearance? find a picture of him. Really? So the reason I'm asking is mm-hmm. if you have two people out to breakfast yep. and one has a very distinct appearance, yep. you are more likely to remember that and to focus on that and not really be able to pay much attention to mm-hmm. or really store in your memory this other 
common appearance female that was with him. Agreed. Yeah. So if you had to bet your paycheck on it or, you know, something mm-hmm. serious. Or there's an investigation going on and police are like, are you 100 percent sure? And you're like, right. oh, my God, I'm not like, right. of course, you're going to say I'm only 75 percent sure. Exactly. Where you may be right. You're second guessing yourself because it's like, I really remember that guy, but mm-hmm. this other person is kind of inconsequential. Yeah, I agree completely. But I'm going to hit you with something right now. And this is probably the most notable thing that came out in the first week of Virginia's disappearance. And that's that this was something Virginia had done before, roughly 25 years prior, back in the 1960s. It's reported in the Boston Globe that Virginia had been dealing with some family issues back in the 60s when this happened. But it's unclear exactly what those issues were. But from there, she ended up running away. The article described the following, quote, At a time when the family was having some problems, Douglas, now 69, left for several days and then returned home. Family members, he added, said that she left home to think things over, end quote. Now, it's been stated that Virginia had been gone during this time between a few days or even up to two weeks. There are many different articles that reported on this, but regardless of exactly how long it was, it was still an extended amount of time, and it certainly made people question now if she was doing that again. Well, duh. I mean, if she's fucking <laughs> ran away before. Yeah. But it seems but as though the circumstances are different. I think that it is something to put in the back of your mind. I completely agree, because the next thing I was literally just about to say was like, the whole purse situation is the big, big red flag to me that makes me think there's no way. And if there's you're going to... No Right. And if you're going to run away, are you going to do it when you're on your way to go spend the weekend at Baja to fucking. Well, yeah, that's what right. I'm saying. Like, you're not somewhere where you're comfortable, like where you know where you're going. Right. It and just you're, doesn't you're make traveling sense. with your husband. It's like, no, you wait until like he's gone and then mm-hmm. you pack your shit and you fucking leave. Yeah. Every single circumstance that's led up to this point now in September of 1988 like these couple days, like the Thursday and Friday of them going on this trip, all this stuff, Mm -hmm. none of it. There's not one single bit of information that we have so far that could make me say, oh, yeah, she probably just decided to up and leave. That's not even an option in my mind, honestly. I mean, you can't say that it's not even like a shred of an option because she has ran away before. Okay, well, maybe I'm just... Tiny shred. uh, uh, Tiny shred for you because you don't know the case. Okay, sure, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you got to think it like if she's done this before, regardless of how small the possibility is. Yeah. There is always that shred of a chance that she did it again. Do I think so? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. At this point, I think without pointing a finger yet, Frank is very sus. I think that if you were trying to plan something to get rid of your wife or to, for whatever reason, whatever, you know, nefarious reason you might want to insert into this Uh uh-huh it's like you now have a wife where you know we were best friends and Mm -hmm. painting this beautiful picture and now i'm retired and we just spend all this time together i bring her breakfast in bed every day and then that's really putting a nice coating on things ain't it it puts a nice coating on things but then she went into the bathroom where she left her purse all these weird things that he's like leaving these notes and stuff which whatever if it's like a common occurrence Mm -hmm. It is what it is. I mean, it's 88 and they were older. But to go in the fucking store while she's going to the bathroom to go get paper cups, like you can't come up with a better idea than that. I know. What a random thing to say, right? Right. It just seems very suspicious. And it seems like if she's done this before, it could be used to try and formulate an alibi. Like, Mm. I didn't have anything to do with this. She's done this before. Like, if anything, Mm -hmm. she may have ran away. That's a really good point. I didn't think about that. I'm not saying that that's what happened. Like, this yeah, is me yeah, talking yeah. to Frank. It's yep. like, I think something bad happened to her and I really want to find her. Mm-hmm. But she has done this before. So it's like kind of building a shield up around Frank to say, hey, she went to the bathroom. You mm-hmm. know, I was going to go get these paper cups because we needed them for no reason at all. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> You can't even think of a reason. There's no logical reason that comes to mind for that. No, it's like, whatever. But. It's very strange. I don't think that she would have done this again, in this instance at least. Mm -hmm. Not under these circumstances. Yeah. She wouldn't have left her purse. If she would have taken her purse... Maybe. It would have opened it up a little bit more for me. Agreed. So, at this point, 
even with this new information being released to the public, the whole, you know, her having left before type thing, the locals were still worried that Virginia had actually been abducted and that they had something to worry about. However, investigators wanted to shut that down right from the get-go and, quote, quell speculation that she may have been abducted, end quote. Authorities did go on to state publicly that there were no indications of foul play at this point in their investigation and that it was simply just considered that of a missing persons case. Well, I mean, from authority standpoint, it's like, how often does a nearly 70-year-old woman get abducted? Mm -hmm. And then when they're talking to the husband and they're gathering all this information, and it seems strange, it doesn't even appear to be, you know, an isolated incident from an outside entity. Mm -hmm. If something happened, it's on Virginia's terms or related to Frank. All right. Well, pretty dang quickly, suspicions arose around the whole scenario. They arose pretty quick for us, but, you know, everybody else is, is getting on board at this time. Well, I mean, did Frank go to breakfast with some other woman? Unclear. Is but... a question. It is a question that I would ask. Like, yeah. Oh, that was, was a Virginia, question I was, had, too. Yeah. Right. Like, was Virginia out of the picture way at the beginning of this? Potentially. So let's keep going. I think the whole reason why suspicion started to come up might have had to do with a particular comment that was made. And that comment was that authorities stated they were unsure if Virginia was ever actually in Belfast, Maine. Bingo. All right. So now, after this particular statement is made, authorities kind of switched gears in terms of those theories we were talking about before. We talked about A, B, and C and all that, but they discussed their new theories, and those are reported in the Boston Globe. The article reads as follows, quote, She may have left here for reasons we don't know on her own, or she may not have ever been here. We have no one telling us that they saw her who can positively identify her, end quote. And now, as we keep moving forward, this is where things start to get really weird. Weirder than they already are? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, as we talk about all these weird things, we do kind of have to back up a little bit in the timeline. I already told you about how Frank decided to go into the store to buy the paper cups that we are so honed in on. Did he have the paper cups? Unclear. The Honestly, car? unclear. I really don't know. If I was a cop, I would say, where the fuck are the paper cups? <laughs> right, you went in for these, but... Right. Apparently, you had made a comment before, and it's so funny that you said this, that you said, he packed the soda, but he needed the cups. No, no. He also bought soda in the store. He bought soda and paper cups. Interesting. And I was like, what are you going to just gin? Fill me a cup of soda right now while I'm driving up to Baja. But like, <laughs> what? It's just so random. I love that warm soda. Right. Isn't it just very strange? Like, why do you need paper cups and soda at that time? Like exactly. It's so strange. I don't know. You can always come up with like an answer for something. But say their next stop was like a bed and breakfast, and they wanted to make sure that they had soda and cups and stuff like that to be able to eat and drink. But you would think that you would go and shop for multiple items. You wouldn't just go and grab these cups and soda, leave a note for your wife while she's just going to the bathroom. Yeah. Like you would wait for her to come back, then maybe go and purchase food, mm -hmm. purchase bread, lunch meat, cups, mm -hmm. soda. Well, and he said in his note, like, gone to grab some stuff in the big store. What the hell's the big store? Well, I think it's the department store, the one that she went into. So fucking go in and wait at the the bathroom, I, and I, when your I wife know. comes out, say, but, hey, let's grab some shit. So you're you're real honed in on this, but I'm about to tell you something even more fucked up. All right. All right? Yep. This is the part of the story where we find out that Frank also decided to buy something else in the store. Condoms. No, I'll give you three guesses. That's the first one. No, no, no. You can't. If you're going to give me three guesses, then I need actual guesses. Oh, fine. Never mind. All right. So this is a department store. Can you tell me if I'm warm or cold as I guess? No. How about this? I'll give two guesses. Mm -hmm. And after the second guess, you need to tell me if I'm warm or cold. Fine. Bleach. No. A hat. No. Those are my two guesses. You are cold. Very cold? Um, well, they're two very, very different things that you just gave me answers Which to. Which one was warmer? The hat is warmer. What was the uh, town they were in? Belfast. 
A Belfast Maine t-shirt. No. Damn it. Lingerie. Lingerie. And, and, come to find out, that lingerie was... Was not in her size. No. Damn. It was later found in her suitcase. What the fuck? It's very strange. But there's more. The whole situation is a big fat what the fuck. Because this other thing that I found as I was researching, it completely piqued my interest the second I read the headline. There's this article in the Boston Globe, and the headline reads, quote, Husband describes couples fight, end quote. Uh Uh-oh. The article goes on to describe the story that Frank told them about he and his wife's argument the day before she disappeared. He stated that on Thursday, September 1st, the same day they spontaneously decided to ship out for their mini vacay, they got into quite a spat. Virginia was outside watering her plants, and Frank had supposedly been out there with her, but then had the urge to use the restroom. So he got up, went inside, and somehow, some way, managed to accidentally lock the screen door behind him. He stated for the Boston Globe that his wife nearly immediately lost it and was at the screen door that was locked, quote, in a fury. Frank elaborated a bit more, stating, quote, She'd come to the door, and when she couldn't get in, she became very, very upset. I think this has happened several times before. I told her I didn't do it on purpose, but she said, You did, you did, you always do this, end quote. <laughs> you know what this makes you think of? Mm. When I'm gone for an extended period of time, and you lock the outside screen door, <laughs> and then I get home, and I'm like, what the fuck? You get I don't so have a- <laughs> mad. <laughs> but so you know mad. what I do? I go to the other door and I open that with the key. Exactly. But I think the thing that's weird here is... But I did have my keys on me. If she's out in the garden, she probably doesn't have her keys on her. How do you accidentally lock it, first of all? Unless it's a flimsy-ass lock. Second of all, how has this happened multiple times and it hasn't been an issue that you've rectified, Frank? (laughs) Fix the door for your wife. Well, not all husbands are as, you know... Hire someone to fix the door for your wife. (laughs) I mean, I don't think it's accidental. If he meant accidental, I would assume that it's like force of habit. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I just think it's like so strange. And then you have to think. So they get into this heated argument. She's upset. Clearly, this has happened before. She's been upset before. And then they're like, okay, let's just let's go up to Bar Harbor. Love you. I know. (laughs) Very weird. (laughs) Why'd you lock me out again? Because I wanted you to be upset when I offered to go on vacation. (laughs) Right? It's It's just a very strange thing. And there is nothing against Virginia here at all. This is Frank being weird. This is Frank's whole situation with like, The way he's telling the press about this. And like, who knows if this fight even happened? Well, I mean, we can't even... You can't hold any judgment against Virginia because she's not here to judge. and She's not here to tell her story. She's not here to tell her story, right. And you don't know what happened from her point of view. Mm -hmm. And like everything that Frank's telling you is fucking whack. His whole whole vibe is completely suspicious he seems like a guy that's worked in the bank for too long and does not know how to commit a crime well i mean <laughs> oh maybe money laundering you, you, but not <laughs> terrible but not, you know yeah he doesn't know how to lie apparently clearly not but like i said before things were getting weird and suspicions were beginning to rise and even more interesting information continued to come out more there's more Now, in the first few days, even the first week, really, after Virginia disappeared, Frank seemed awfully willing to speak to the press. Obviously, we've given all these previous quotes. And we know that he seemed pretty set before on the fact that they had a great relationship, that they were best friends, and there was no conceivable way she'd have run off. Yet he also kind of started to contradict himself after discussing this whole fight that they supposedly had, and now even more so with this statement. The Boston Globe reported on what Frank had to say about his wife's mental health. It reads, quote, She has emotional swings that are very abrupt. It doesn't take her but a few minutes to go from being happy to being depressed. But within 15 minutes, she'll be in good spirits again. End quote. Hmm. I don't know. It's, um... Just keeps piling on here, right? From an investigative standpoint, I would have to have this guy in front of me and asking the questions, Mm -hmm. reading body language... For sure. Asking follow-up questions and leading questions to see what kind of answer I get, what kind of answer I want, and what Mm -hmm. kind of answer he gives. Yep. But it seems like he's just trying to paint the picture of she's done this before. She has mood swings. 
we had this fight. Maybe, you know, she was walking into the store and thought back on our fight. And then she's like, you know what? I'm out of here. I don't want to deal with this. It's like, it seems like he's trying to pile on Mm -hmm. against Virginia as opposed to being like, no, like she would never do this, like this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when you're talking to investigators, you want to give all the pertinent information, everything that you can, anything Mm -hmm. that could help. But it's like, do these little digs here and there really help yeah with the investigation did he have maybe something to against do with it? him it, yeah right so something i wanted to mention too because i keep saying like all of this is happening so early on in the investigation and you have to really think about that and that's why i'm trying to like you know really send it home for you is like within the first couple days he's Literally, within four days, they searched the wooded area for four days. He's got this search party. He's calling family up there. He's got a tip line. He's got all this stuff. But then within the latter half of that week, he's now saying, oh, well, she was mentally unwell. She did this before. We got in this big fight. Like, how can you just snap so fast from, oh, my God, my missing wife. I need to spare no expense, no time, get everyone I possibly can here to then completely flip your switch. What happened? Well, Who asked him something that set him off to now be like, now I got to I gotta change my story around here and I got to fix this? Well, somebody that may not know or may not have a great plan put forward mm. on how to do this may not understand the relative time from somebody looking at this from the outside perspective. Yeah. When you say, you know, when you've been out there for four days looking for someone mm-hmm. and you haven't come up with anything. Yep. And then you're constantly being talked to by police and investigators and this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. Time gets away from you and whatever plan you may have had to set forward or whatever expectations you may have had mm-hmm. kind of are fleeting. Agreed. And who knows? It's like eventually any of your protective walls for yourself will start to fall after a certain amount of time. And when you're really embroiled in this for so long, it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, the floodgates open and you just start giving all the information, even if you maybe not had set out wanting to. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So, obviously, before we talked about the fact that Frank said they were best friends and, you know, he's trying to come out with all this, like, happy stuff. I wonder what her favorite breakfast in bed was. That's a question I'd ask. It's a good question. What'd you bring her? Yeah, what'd you bring her for breakfast? What'd you she know what like? You know what I would do? I would say, I would be talking to him. Okay, what's the timeline? Okay, you went to friendlies, mm. you went to this, you went to that. And then when he starts talking about, oh, I'm your best friend, what did you bring her for breakfast in bed? Mm-hmm. Well, what did she order at friendlies? Was it similar or completely Does different? Does she like two eggs over medium with toast? Mm-hmm. And she or a Belgian a waffle. Or a Belgian waffle at friendlies? Oh, so good. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. those are the type of questions that you ask to start picking things apart. I Yeah, that's perfect. So I mentioned that because it's later discovered that things are not as hunky-dory as Frank previously made them out to be. Friends believed the couple had a relatively normal marriage. However, family mentioned how unpleasant Frank was to be around and that he became, quote, critical of Virginia. And because he filled all his time with extracurricular activities that did not include Virginia, she seemed to be awfully lonely. Doesn't seem like he would come forward saying, let's take the weekend to travel up to Bar Harbor. No, it does not seem that way. It seems like they would never go on vacation together. He would say, hey, I have a a meeting with someone. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it seems like he's retired at this point. But, yeah, they were. Oh, I'm going to so-and-so with my buddy Well, it was know, like Mike. golf or maybe pickleball exactly. or like all these things. It's right. like, oh, I'm going to go hang out with my buddy Jack. We're going to go do whatever. Like, you know. It Not just... even that nicely. It would be like. No, it'd be Joe Schmo. <laughs> That's who you go play no, pickleball I'm, with. Uh, I'm, I'm leaving for the weekend. Oh, where are you going? None of your business. That type of thing. You know, yeah, like... but then people also did say, though, that they did travel together. I had mentioned that before. It wasn't totally out of the ordinary for this spontaneous trip, even though it was a little weird. It wasn't like, oh, my God, this is so strange. But who knows if it was like something that Virginia really wanted to do. And after he spent the last month golfing and playing pickleball mm-hmm. and doing all these other things, right, maybe right. he was finally like, fine, we'll go on a trip. And then sure. they usually had like a last minute trip. Yeah, this is sure. just I'll totally go up there me. With you. Yeah, I'll go up there with you, but then I'll do my own thing when I'm up there. Yeah, I mean, it could be anything. So I just think, like, we have to look at all sides of it. Like, sure, maybe he didn't ever want to take trips with her, but also you have to look at it as they still did travel, but why? Right, and and you're kind of looking at it from, like, the statements from what you would assume are unbiased 
witnesses to mm-hmm. their yes to their life. relationship exactly right and um if they're saying you know things didn't seem that great and you know he always talked down to her and mm-hmm. it was just like not a good thing like if he's talking down to her publicly what do you think it is behind At closed home, doors exactly yeah so yep all right so now as we move on in the story we had roughly gotten to about the first week week and a half max two weeks into the investigation and we've kind of pretty much exhausted everything that had come out in that time frame so now we're going to fast forward a bit this time to october of 1988 so only about you know a month at the at max two months from when she went missing now i hadn't really discussed much in terms of the kids and their assistance with searching for their missing mother but during the first few days they definitely were helping with the searches they were up in belfast They had checked the house in Lexington because, remember, Ginny lived there at the time. So they were all very involved in the search for their mother. And they're all adults. Correct. But by October, the two daughters, Marilyn and Ginny, were pretty dang certain that their mother was dead, not just missing. They had even recently started searching more rural areas in Maine, and they were searching specifically for their mother's body. They did not expect to find her alive at this point. Also, the reason for these additional searches was because they desperately wanted to give their mother a proper burial. So even though authorities' investigation had kind of petered out, the girls weren't giving up hope. They told the Boston Globe, quote, We know that our mother is not alive and that she is not going to be found, end quote. I wonder if they gave any insight into why they believe she was dead. Let's keep going. Even though Marilyn and Ginny were sure their mother was deceased, Frank, and I do believe I'm pretty sure, not 100% positive, but I do believe their son, Doug, believed that Virginia was still alive. So, daughters are on one side of things, dad and son are another side. So, it kind of seems it's like two against two here and what they think happened. Sure, you think like a family dynamic, you have three women, two men, you'd assume the men would usually band together. Definitely in 88. Maybe not so much today, but... Yeah, you never know. I mean, if you had to flip a coin and say, you know, uh, what do you think happened? It's Mm -hmm. like, I think it's fair to assume that men might side one way, women the other. See, I would think that the men would think she's dead. And that the women would have more hope. Well, that's why I want to know... What's making them think Why do the daughters think that she's dead? Is it because of related to Frank Sr.? Mm -hmm. Because if that's the case... And that's what they're going with. And Doug always went with his dad. Mm -hmm. That's why he would be like, no, she's still alive. Because he doesn't want to believe that his dad had something to do with his mother's death. Because he's always banded together with his dad. Yeah, I totally totally see what you're saying. But then, by November of 1988, so now like two, three months after she'd gone missing, the division between the daughters and the dad and son was very obvious. You see, the daughters had set up a memorial for Virginia to take place in November and to kind of serve as like their remembrance of their mother since they couldn't have a funeral. However, both Frank and Doug were not attending. And also by this time, Frank didn't want to talk to the press anymore. Apparently he said all he needed to in the first couple weeks. But now at this point, I feel like it couldn't get weirder But it does. So, first of all, literally within days of her mother going missing, Ginny had actually moved out of the home she shared with her parents to move in with her sister instead. And remember, Marilyn was living in Manchester, New Hampshire at the time. That's a little under an hour drive from Lexington. Now, I don't know exactly where Ginny worked, like what airline or what airport. I would assume probably Boston Logan, but either way... Seems like she might have been extending her commute a bit by moving out. So what could be the reason? I would assume that she no longer felt safe with just her father in the home. I can see why you're saying that, but we really don't find out just yet. But we do find out. Well, sort of. Over the coming months, comments were made to the press that seemed to shine a light on what might have prompted the decision for her to move out. Now, the daughters told reporters that they believed their mother was murdered and that they knew who did it, but couldn't say anything about who they thought was responsible because of, quote, legal reasons, end quote. Because of legal reasons? Correct. 
Authorities, of course, had covered their butts and said that there was no indication still that Virginia had been murdered. But literally within days of Virginia going missing, Ginny had been at their home in Lexington and she'd found a note from her father. That note stated, quote, we're taking an impromptu trip up the main coast, end quote. But not only did she find that, she found something else very, very suspicious. Also, don't forget, authorities had gone to the house at one point to check to see if Virginia was there, but it seems as though there wasn't like a full-blown search at that point until a few days later, and it seems as though this search was prompted after Ginny found whatever it is that she found and called police and then subsequently moved out. So I'm not going to keep you in the dark any longer about what Ginny found. There were two things that seemed to have prompted her to call. One was blood found on the bedroom carpet. Totally unclear how much, but it's still blood on the carpet. And then the second was a tuft of hair found in one of the door jams. (laughs) What the fuck? During one of the initial searches of the home, which there were at least two, so I don't know if that includes like that first like initial just checking to see if she was there or if there were two other ones after that, but a piece of carpet was taken from the home. And I can bet you that carpet was most likely taken from the bedroom. And I will say, though, what's weird is that at that point when those searches took place, Frank Douglas was cooperating. And I guess he even gave authorities permission to search the property based on the Boston Globe's reporting on the fact that the search was done without a warrant. Interesting. So I don't want to assume what they did the first time when they were going to check to see if Virginia was back at the house. I agree. Yeah. It could have been a house check and being like, oh, hey, knock, knock, knock. Virginia, are you home? Mm -hmm. Are you home? Maybe done that, you know, multiple times throughout the day Mm -hmm. in case she was sleeping, in case whatever. If there were no signs of anything, you know, mischievous at the house, Mm -hmm. like, you know, everything seemed normal, they probably wouldn't force entry into the house because nobody appears to be, you know, in distress. Mm -hmm. But if they had access to the house and they did a walkthrough, I find it odd that nobody would be like, what the fuck is this blood in this hair? And Exactly, and yeah. Thing, it's like, you know? okay, maybe if it was like three drops, you wouldn't notice it. But like if it's enough to cut out a piece of the carpet to take for forensic testing, I mean. Well, I mean, you could cut out a piece of carpet for a single drop of blood. Yeah, but if. But the tuft of hair been in a the nose door jam, blade. it doesn't matter. You're right. It could have been a single drop of blood. They would still cut out the carpet to. I guess, to take yeah. Evidence. So. I don't think the quantity really matters, but like when you're walking through a house looking for somebody, making sure things aren't amiss, mm-hmm. things catch your eye. Yeah. A tuft of hair in the door jam. Well, that's probably why it caught Ginny's eye. That's fucking weird. Right. Who would have a tuft of hair in the door jam? It's one of those things where you, when you're walking into the room, mm-hmm. it like catches your eye. Yeah. And you have to have that instinct to be like, what the fuck is that? Mm-hmm. But then the drop of blood, like if it's on carpet, it's like. It's right there, you know. And if it's close to the tuft of hair, too, I could say, like, oh, yeah, we'll probably take it. Right. So if the tuft of hair was in a door jam, I would assume the blood was probably near it, too. Maybe, you know, somebody got pushed into the door jam, mm-hmm. cut their head, split their head or whatever. Yeah. That's why the hair is there. Maybe it got caught in the um, in the hinges mm-hmm. because of the metal and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So I think that's probably what they mean by door jam, but not yeah. entirely sure. Yeah, but... Um, so I don't want to say that they guaranteed definitely would have done a walkthrough. Mm-hmm. If they had access to the house, they probably would have did a walkthrough to look for her. But who knows? I mean, the husband was still, Frank was still up in Maine Maine at the time. Yeah. So if they just went by and knocked on the door to see if somebody was there, mm-hmm. they wouldn't have seen that. But now they did the, the search after the daughter mm-hmm. was like, what Hey, the I fuck found some fucked up on? shit in my house. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so, Frank, man. I know. Come on, bro. So that same Boston Globe article that I mentioned before also went on to describe what was found. It stated, quote, soon after, police removed from the house a piece of carpet bearing blood of Virginia Douglas's type and some of her hair, which was found snagged in a doorstop, according to sources close to the investigation, end quote. Some of her hair. Her hair and her blood type. So we know it's more than likely hers. Sure. So, I mean, but they said blood type, Mm -hmm. her hair. Correct. So it's definitely hers. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure she's now headbanging around the fucking the floor no i mean (laughs) this is fucking weird i'm sure she's not headbanging to metallica around the fucking you know house and banging her head on the door jam by accident no definitely not if it's definitely her hair 
and her blood type, Mm -hmm. how often do you think a tuft of hair would be ripped out in a door jam with blood in the general vicinity Mm -hmm. and then not linked to the same person? Exactly. Now, I want to move on to something else for a minute and discuss something that Ginny said about her parents' spontaneous adventure for the weekend. She claimed that it was strange for them to leave on such short notice and... I guess Virginia always wanted to be home on the nights that Ginny would come home from a trip, like meaning her airline hostess job. She was likely gone for days at a time, and her mom probably wanted to be there when she returned, especially since she was living there now and had gotten a divorce recently. It's been stated that many people close to the couple agreed with that fact. A neighbor even told the Boston Globe, quote, She always said that little Ginny was due in at such and such a time, and she always tried to be there. It was nice for Ginny to be there. It just confounds me that they would leave so soon before she was expected home, end quote. However, the son had said his parents always took impromptu trips like this, and it was, quote, impossible for Virginia to always be there when Ginny got home from work. That's Doug siding with Frank Sr., and that is Ginny being truthful, essentially, in my opinion. Like, mm-hmm. if let's assume that what these other people had witnessed in regards to Frank Sr. and Virginia's marriage. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not that great. It's kind of rocky. He's always kind of down on her type shit. Yep. Do you not think that she would be so excited for her daughter to come home and stay with them? Mm -hmm. It's like her only reprieve from her poor relationship with her husband. Yeah, she must have been thrilled to have her back. I mean, come on, look at your mom. She would be like, come home. I'm so happy. Right. It's like... It's one of those things where it's like she would probably tell Frank, no, I don't want to go because Jenny's coming home. Because when you're a retiree, what does it matter when you go on vacation? Doesn't. It doesn't. And it's an Mm -hmm. impromptu thing. It's not something that like, you know, you paid for plane tickets and you can't Mm -hmm. cancel because you'll be out hundreds of dollars. Mm -hmm. So So, why that night? There's a reason there. Mm -hmm. There's got to be. And I'm going back to Doug or Frank Jr. or whatever, siding with his dad. Mm-hmm. And Ginny being truthful yeah. about how her mother always wanted to be there when she came home. It's like, you know, when you're an empty nester, mm-hmm. it's like you almost feel a sense of loss. Obviously, yeah. we're not that, but from anecdotal conversations I've had with other people, it's like yeah. once your kids leave the house, it's like it's, like it's empty. Mm-hmm. So, of course, she would be excited when her daughter would be coming home and she would probably plan her vacations around when her daughter was traveling. Absolutely. So, if she knew she was coming back that night, I mean, come on. Right. She'd be there. Yeah. So, anyway, to go back to the house in Lexington, Ginny said it looked very peculiar when she had gotten there after she'd returned from her trip. So, I think this was kind of in the in-between of like finding the suspicious stuff and calling the police but she wouldn't go into too too many specifics but just said it quote looked as though they left in a hurry end quote Mm. and according to the charlie project's write-up on the case the fridge was full and all the blinds were still open so it seemed as though this could have been like an abrupt departure just based on what we know so far i can't even go to bed without the blinds being closed truly any people in this world who leave their blinds open and just let anybody out in the world stare into your house in the dark, <laughs> you are fucking nuts. You got to change your I ways. Can, I cannot get behind that. You could be my best friend in the world, and if you do that, I'm going to think you're a weirdo. And you got to change your ways. You got to change your ways. And lock your doors and lock your windows. We talk about the locking <laughs> of the windows. feel like we haven't said it a lot recently. Just going to throw it in here for good measure. Lock the doors. And lock the windows. All right, so I've given you a lot of weird stuff, right? So are we going to get not weird stuff now? Oh, no, we're going to get weirder. (laughs) (laughs) So earlier, we discussed at the department store the weirdness of Frank buying the cups and the even more weirdness of Frank buying the lingerie. But we didn't really go too, too much into the specifics there. So I want to go back a little bit because later on in reporting on this case, some things regarding where the couple stopped and what happened during that time frame of Virginia going missing is revealed. So, first of all, authorities were curious as to why the Douglases had stopped at this Rennie's shopping plaza in the first place. I guess there was a McDonald's location that would have been either more convenient to stop at or maybe easier to get to. I don't know the specifics of why the McDonald's would have been the better choice, but that's what's been stated. But either way, when asked about this, Frank and his son had said that Virginia specifically liked to use department store restrooms. Okay. 
I mean, I was ready to say something at the beginning when you talked about McDonald's. Mm. Sure, whatever. I mean, if you have a particular affinity for fucking department store bathrooms... It's one thing, but like you don't bring your purse into fuck off. Yeah. Like, come on. Like you're like, I want the good lighting so I can touch up my face. Like, right. get out of here. Otherwise, I'd go to the McDonald's. But right. like, come on. But also you gotta think, Frank went to McDonald's. Correct. He did the next day, yeah. So it's like if Frank was a big fucking McDonald's guy and he didn't like his wife to begin with because it seemed like they had a rocky relationship from the outside looking in, mm-hmm. he would have been like yeah, we're not stopping at there. We're going we're to going McDonald's. We're going to McDonald's because I want my McRib. Their fries are delicious. And back then they were fried in beef tallow and now they're fried in vegetable Soybean oils. oil. Did they even have a McRib back in 88? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine we're just going off about McRibs. It came out in 89. Know. Right. Shit. All right. Now we're at the thing that stopped me in my tracks when I was researching this case. You weren't stopped prior to this? No. <laughs> I was, but not like this. I audibly gasped, squinted my eyes, and leaned in closer to my laptop screen to reread this again, because it is so mind-boggling to me. And again, it has to do with the lingerie purchase. Or shall I say, purchases. (laughs) Because I guess there were two. The Boston Globe reported, quote, Doug Douglas said that his father often bought lingerie as gifts for his wife and daughter Ginny, end quote. What the fuck? Wait, it continues with a statement Doug made. It reads, quote, it sounds unusual, but given his past history, I can understand. Who knows what we would do under the same circumstances? He said to me, He was absolutely devastated, panicked, and for a little straw of hope, he bought lingerie to say she was coming back, end quote. What the actual fuck is going on with this guy? (laughs) Who buys lingerie for their daughter? Isn't this so strange? But wait, hold on. Before you even say anything else, because this, first of all, this is the most fucking ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. But of course, the daughters denied that Frank ever bought them underwear. And they certainly seemed suspicious about this whole thing. Is Doug all right? I don't know. But what's even (laughs) funnier, and I I don't want this to seem like it's funny because it's really not, but the next line in this article reads, quote, the Douglas daughters who say their father never bought panties for them or their mother, end quote. And I was (laughs) just like, what the? Oh, my God. This is like profanity filled because you just can't not say what the fuck. Honestly. Because it does not make sense. This is a horrible, horrible way to try and cover up something. If that's what you're doing, yeah. holy shit, you did not plan. Uh, seriously, I mean, I have questions about Doug's mental capacity. I have questions like, if I had daughters, the only thing I'd be buying them, like, lingerie-related would be a chastity belt. <laughs> and I'd have the key and say, you know, if somebody wants to get in this, you got to come fucking... Talk to me, you're going to have to date her for a real long time and then ask my permission. I might not even give it to you. That is insane. What what Do you see what I mean where I said, like, I just... As a woman, what was going through your head when you saw that a father allegedly bought lingerie for a daughter? Couple things. So first is, absolutely not. Second is, I remember even as a kid... Like when you would get like underwear for Christmas and your parents would sign it, it would always just be signed from mom because it's Mm -hmm. fucking weird. Your dad does not buy you underwear, even if they're like day of the week underwear when you're seven. (laughs) So you mean Santa never signed your underwear? (laughs) (laughs) No. From Santa, here's the lingerie. (laughs) (laughs) No. So I think about it that way. And it's like, at least in, in my family dynamic, it was like, it was just signed mom or you know it was like it wasn't from dad that was a weird thing so it's it's like just never mind just like like i just said like day of the week underwear like when you're little you wear like oh these are my monday underwear yay but it's like (laughs) you're buying lingerie for your daughter no no it's a sexual thing exactly it's a provocative thing it's a very weird like the only time the only circumstance that that's okay would be if it's like a mother-in-law giving it to a daughter-in-law at a bridal shower. Right. Like, that's like, oh, you're marrying my son. Like, this is what it is. Whatever. Like, it's kind of a cutesy, fun, like, little winky thing. Whatever. That's a mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship. 
assuming you hopefully have a good one. I'm going to take care of your grandkids eventually. Type yeah, thing. exactly. <laughs> but like, if the father-in-law did that, you'd be like, that is fucking creepy. Like, he, he'd give it to you when you open it, he like winks at you. Yeah, <laughs> it's like... <laughs> I'm not marrying into this family. Like, that's like, weird. I'm never talking to you again, sir. Exactly. So Stay it's like from me. just the fact that it's the dad by, like claiming that he bought this for the daughter before. Like, even whatever. It also even if it's says. Coming from Doug, it's, this is coming from Doug, though. Yes, because Frank stopped speaking to the press. So you would assume that this is just my opinion on it. And I could be way off base because I haven't talked to these people firsthand. Of course. But it seems like Doug is being coached by Frank Sr., any mm. or influenced by Frank Sr., in my opinion. And why would he come out with the statement that his dad has done this before, mm-hmm. purchasing lingerie for, you know, yeah. a child? Essentially, yes. Not like child by like age, his but child, yes. His child, even though she's an adult. But also, no. I think we're kind of glossing over the fact that he is using the excuse of. I went in and bought the lingerie as like this symbol of hope that she's going to come back to me. What a fucking shitty excuse. Come back to you. Where did she go? Because he bought the lingerie before he she was reported missing. I know, but think about it. I bought this lingerie. They're not divorced. They're not separated. They're going on fucking vacation together. Mm -hmm. Why would I have to buy you lingerie? Hoping that you would come back to me. We're fucking on vacation together. She was obviously not there. I think that's what we're we're getting at. I get that. That's what I'm trying to emphasize is mm. she went to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. He went into the department store. Mm-hmm. He bought his cups. He bought his soda. Mm-hmm. He but bought he, lingerie. Wait, I think you're missing a piece. He went back to the car after the first time, remember? He waited for okay. 15 more minutes and then he went back in. Oh, so he bought the lingerie after. Yes, when he was like, hey, call for my wife over the loudspeaker. I don't know where she is. I'm worried. Okay. That's when he bought it. So she must have some mental connection to the cash register to say, Frank Sr. just bought lingerie. Come back to the car, honey. Exactly. Like, this makes no sense. How would she know that you bought the lingerie? Why would she come back because you bought lingerie if she ran away in the first place? Like, this guy is nuts. So... My question is, why not just like buy a candle and be like, oh, we're religious. I lit a candle like as a beacon of hope that my wife would come back to me. I was so upset. Like, that's a better excuse. Like, why am I coming up with better excuses than this fucking guy? Yeah, I mean, we never do cases like this. This is the weirdest, most bizarre case that you have put in front of me in 42 episodes, 43 now. Yeah, you think? This is just so weird. I know, isn't it? Like, outside of the twists and turns that have occurred throughout the the course of the early investigation, and then as the daughter comes home and stuff, it's like the intricacies of what happened Mm -hmm. are really, really weird and really questionable. And then you think about, like, the allegiances of Doug with his dad, and, like, why is Doug saying that this happened before, while Ginny's like... What the fuck? And she calls the cops and she says mm-hmm. that the hair's there. It's like she noticed that something was off from the get go. And then you have Doug essentially seeming like he's just a puppet for his dad. Yeah. It is a wild and weird case. I completely agree, but I'm just going to keep adding some more on. All right. I might as well just keep piling it on. So there's another thing that's discovered around the same time, and that's that Frank didn't call Ginny the night that Virginia went missing to let her know what had happened. Literally the fact that her mother was missing. And Jenny came home that night. So all he had to do was call the house. Correct. And get this. You already just gave the answer. But in the articles that reported on this, supposedly Frank gave the excuse of, oh, I don't know where Jenny was that weekend. And Jenny was like, uh, no, you totally knew where I was. <laughs> I was we, coming home. Right? We specifically discussed this. Like, right. you knew where I was going to be. So then you might say, well, why didn't he call Marilyn? Well, apparently, he and Marilyn had been estranged for some time. It was reported that they hadn't spoken since the early 80s. I wonder why they were estranged. I mean, it's it's really hard to say. And I mean, just looking at it, Right now, it's like 
you have some people like friends and stuff saying, oh, Frank seemed really upset about his missing wife. We saw that he was putting in all this effort in the beginning. But now you're hearing these things come out from the daughters and you're even hearing these things come out that Frank's saying. So it's like you're seeing two different sides of it. And it's like, how do you decipher what's true, what's not? Like, oh, my God, I feel like my brain's on fire. Well, you have to be able to have a good judge of character. And you have to be able to gauge, like, from an investigation standpoint, you have to be able to say, you know, is this a naive person? Mm -hmm. Is this a person that looks for the best in people? Is this a glass half full person? Or is this a realist? Because when you have, you know, friends and family or friends coming forward and being like, oh, yeah, this is great. Yet you have more intimate members of the family being Mm -hmm. like, shit was not good. Like, Mm -hmm. You know, he was critical of her stuff. He didn't involve her in the things that he did. And you have to be able to rule out or at least differentiate between the harder, more concrete, more realistic Mm -hmm. facts that are given for some people or statements that are given from some people versus the ones that are just like, oh, yeah, they seemed wonderful Mm -hmm. and no problems whatsoever. You know, it's yeah, it, it really comes down to investigative tactics and. The people that are doing the interviews, whether it be detectives or or patrolmen or whatever, their ability to sniff out bullshit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th- you could smell this guy's bullshit from three states over. Right. Truly. Yeah. But anyway, around the one year anniversary of Virginia's disappearance, authorities received information that prompted them to search in the area of Maine's Sabago Lake region. They searched the area and the lake for roughly six hours the first day, and they even continued on to a second day of searching, but unfortunately didn't find any sign of her there. And also, by this time, the investigation was actually mostly taking place in Massachusetts, not Maine anymore. Police also put out at this time that they were not going to reclassify Virginia's case from a missing persons to a murder unless they found her body. And from there, not much was really reported on for roughly two more years, However, what comes out around the third anniversary is exactly what I think you've all been thinking as we've been working through this case. Now, at this point, authorities believe Frank Douglas had something to do with the disappearance of Virginia Douglas. A Lexington PD lieutenant stated, quote, Frank Douglas is a suspect in the disappearance of his wife. Suspect? My personal opinion is that she is dead, though this is still a missing persons case, end quote. Yep, you heard that right. He's a suspect. So, questions I'd ask during the interview process with mm-hmm. Frank Sr. Yeah. When did you last gas up? Did you pay cash for your gas? What about the motel? Do you have receipts? Cash for that. Mm-hmm. Like, do you have receipts to back this up? To try and find inconsistencies in yeah. the story of this is where I was, this is where we went, this is when we did stuff this is when i gassed up because you got to think we already questioned or i was questioning because you already know this Mm -hmm. i was questioning why is it taking so long to get to this place Mm -hmm. like it's a four and a half hour drive why is it taking two days like why would you (laughs) why would you leave at yeah why not just leave friday morning right why would you probably early birds go at 4 a.m you'll be there by 10 the latest if you go really slow like so even with traffic so the questions that i'd be looking to answer are amount of gas used if you have receipts for where you bought gas Mm -hmm. really trying to put a uh not necessarily timeline but more of a map of Mm -hmm. like where this guy's actually saying that he went yeah because he's saying he's giving this story he's saying i started here i ended up here with my wife then we were here together blah 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 but it's like People can say whatever they want to say. Right, but there are, know. A lot of, there are a lot of little pieces that people don't think about mm-hmm. that you can start to pick apart. And then when you're asking them questions mm-hmm. that they didn't anticipate or that they didn't plan for, mm-hmm. they get worried. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of times when people get themselves into situations like this, whether it was on purpose or not, they're making it way more complicated. And they're like creating this story for themselves that they're never going to be able to remember. And not, they will find the authorities will find a hole. Do not tell authorities what you think they want to hear. Tell them what you know to be factually true. Yep. So now that authorities had officially named Frank specifically as a suspect, 
it appears as though the daughters were able to speak out. Ha 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 ha. I want to know what they have to say. Oh, I'll tell you. You could kind of tell before that they believed it might have been their dad that was involved, but here's the new comment. Quote, No one believes the death of Ginny Douglas was planned. Rather, most people think what happened was an accident. When he realized what he had done, he panicked, carelessly disposed of the body, and concocted a ridiculous story that fooled no one. Not the police, family and friends, not even total strangers. End quote. Well, it seemed to have convinced some people that were like, oh, they had a great life together. But again, I say a lot of people are naive. I completely agree. You and I, not so much. I completely agree with that as well. (laughs) But I will say, Frank's son at this point was still completely on his side, and it really seems as though this whole tragedy had totally divided the family in half. But yet, more and more years would go by with no reports in the news about Virginia Douglas until the 10th anniversary, so that would be 1998. The current chief at the time, who was actually a sergeant back when Virginia went missing, told the Bangor Daily News that he felt some of Frank's story about what had happened was, quote, troubling. He also talked about something that completely stunned me, because I think this brings the idea of Frank maybe having killed his wife and then concocting this story make even more sense and seem likely. And again, of course, it goes back to the lingerie. Literally, in my notes, I have this big comment in all caps and stars. It's highlighted and it says, Weird. So let me just tell you what the chief told the Bangor Daily News specifically regarding the lingerie we've talked about a bajillion times already. He stated, quote, Other than the underwear bought by Douglas, there were no other women's undergarments in the suitcase. End quote. Let me... So Virginia didn't pack any undies for the fucking trip? (laughs) My first initial thought with this whole thing was that he was panicking and like quick, quick packed up a suitcase after whatever happened, happened and forgot to put underwear in there. And then assuming there'd be an investigation, once obviously whatever plan this was Uh, goes, goes forward and he remembers, shit, there's no underwear in the suitcase, which would probably come off as a little fucking weird. He then conveniently stumbles upon this department store and he's like, that'll fix the problem. Yes. I will say, if you want to play devil's advocate with me, of course, Virginia could have forgotten to pack undergarments, but I don't know. I just feel like with everything else, and then that strange comment that Frank made about hoping that buying this lingerie would bring her back, just really makes me think that there's no way she forgot them, and he was like trying to help her out by buying them for her while she went to the bathroom. Why would he come up with a story like this when all he could say to police was, Oh, she forgot underwear, so while she was in the bathroom, I bought some for her for the trip. I mean, I think that's much more believable if police were like, why is there lingerie in her bag that has tags on it and she had no under- other underwear in there? He could just say, oh, well, she asked me, like, while she was going to the bathroom, if I could just grab, you know, some underwear for her. No, if she was going to the bathroom, she would have taken her purse, and if she needed underwear, she would have bought her own fucking underwear. I completely agree with that, but I'm just saying, if anybody wants to try and play devil's advocate for with me, <laughs> then that's my response to you, but I still think it's a bunch of bullshit. Yes, I will say, we have been on several vacations since we started dating and have since been married. Mm -hmm. There has never once, no matter how impromptu this vacation has been, (laughs) that you have forgotten to pack underwear. No matter what, people usually always overpack underwear. I feel like I've never met an underpacker of underwear. Frank, 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 Frank. Yeah, but. Come on. Even with all of these suspicions, even with Frank being named a freaking suspect, nothing else comes out, like, at all. There's barely any recent reporting on this case. It just kind of went stale. I don't know. Authorities must not have had what they needed to charge him. I mean, I don't think there are really any other options here, right? I guess. I mean, what physical evidence do you have? You don't have a body. You don't have really anything. I mean... I don't know, because you know that if he called the police from that department store, she was probably never there. So what Mm -hmm. are you going to find up there? Nothing. That's why they never, they found not one single sign, not one inkling of her entire being, being exactly outside of the one statement. But 
he claims he saw her walking on the side of the road. Do you know how skewed that could be? Right, and all we really have for physical evidence to try and formulate some type of opinion is blood that matches Virginia mm -hmm. in the house, mm -hmm. as well as hair in the door jam. Mm -hmm. They said it was like a tuft or like a clump of hair. It wasn't I mean, just that's... like a single hair. Yeah. It was a fair amount of hair. And I mean, if a fair amount of hair is getting ripped out of your head and then there's also, let's just call it droplets because mm -hmm. we don't know how much mm -hmm. droplets of blood on the ground. I mean, that's got to be a pretty big scalp wound and a lot of well, hair. Well, but see, I wouldn't think that there would be blood in one spot and hair in another. I think there would be blood where the hair is if it were a head wound. I would think that there would be hair in the door jam and then blood within steps of that because if you think if you smack your head on something for instance i was uh demolishing an old building at one point when i was younger it was just like we were this just, is a new story <laughs> to me so uh we were just like demoing the mm -hmm. area because it was honestly i don't remember why but it was a business that we worked for and we we're just demoing it and i hit a table or I guess you would call it like a shelf mm -hmm. that we used to, to like prepare stuff on with a sledgehammer mm -hmm. and it split in half, but then half of it came and hit me in the head. Oh, lovely. Right? So then I'm walking away and I feel the blood dripping down my head. But like as I'm walking. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. It's coming down my face and my head and then over my eyebrow and yep, stuff. And then it, it doesn't drop until I'm steps away from it. Yeah. I didn't even realize it. Yep. So mm -hmm. I would say that if there's a tuft of hair in the door jam, the blood should be within a few steps of that area. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I think for me that like, and I don't think it's even been said this way either, but I kept envisioning it like towards the ground, not like up on like a higher hinge of the door. Oh, okay. I was thinking like, say you're having an argument with somebody and they're walking past you and you just shove them and it's like, yeah. bam, head into the wall type yeah. thing. Yeah, I didn't think of it that way, but I see what you were saying, like your side of things, how that would totally be possible. So, Well, I say you and I had an argument or whatever and I'm walking past you and I'm walking into the thing. You push me from behind, I hit my head and whatever, it pulls out a tuft of hair and then as I keep walking or I turn or I stumble into the room couple steps away there's the blood droplets or whatever it may yeah. not be a ton of blood but mm -hmm. like we were saying earlier when you're collecting the the carpet area they may have collected you know like one or two drops of blood it doesn't have to be a ton mm -hmm. but it could have been enough for somebody to lose consciousness or whatever and fall to the ground so agreed so i want to just go back for a second to the theories that authorities had kind of come out with so we know that there were four the first was the possibility of Virginia running off, which I think we have already completely debunked to say it's not possible, not in my opinion anyway. The biggest reason is the purse for me. Yeah, I would agree with the purse. Like, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for her to take the purse into the department store while she's going to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So that's a flag there. But also, I don't think that even if she had ran away in the past before, mm -hmm. this would have been the appropriate time to do so or the most opportune time to do so. I agree completely. So then option two, she got disoriented and was lost. But I think that's doubtful just based on what family and friends have said, the fact that she was of sound mind and body, and just also knowing that she had run away before, but she did so purposefully. Right. And I think if you were looking at the original three scenarios or theories, mm -hmm. This is the one that's always going to be in limbo because mental health is always, you know, up in the air. Yeah. Things can always happen. Is this likely? Very, very, very unlikely. Not showing any signs previously, not having multiple sightings. Mm -hmm. Sure, you have one person saying, oh, I saw her on, walking on Route 3, but she has, you know, a pretty common appearance. So it's like she could have been confused for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I think... Option B or theory B is pretty easy to be like, at least dismissive of. Yeah, I agree. Then there was option C, which was the fact that she, how they put it, was absconded with someone else. So whether she ran away with somebody or she was abducted, I would see it more along the lines of her maybe being abducted. I don't know. It doesn't seem like she had any other like life 
or like why would she meet someone in Bar Harbor? That's weird. But then I think like, why did no one hear a scream? Where could she have been abducted from? It's Friday night on Labor Day weekend at a shopping mall or a shopping plaza. There's probably a lot of people around. How is any of that even remotely possible? Like you said, there was no screaming. There was no disturbance Mm -hmm. created by anything going on in the area. Exactly. So I would say that C, absconding with someone else, is absolutely the most outlandish of the three. Agreed. I would say, honestly... B would be the most likely. Mm-hmm. Followed Just because by A. you can't like. Right. Because you can't grasp like when that type of stuff happens yeah. to, some, to somebody. Mm-hmm. And then A. Mm-hmm. But she ain't going to do it because she left the fucking purse there. She would have yeah. taken her fucking money. She would have taken her credit card. She would have taken her eye drops. She would have taken all that stuff with her if she planned to run. And then C is just like. No. She was probably never there. Well, then that just leaves the last theory. That she was never in Belfast, Maine to begin with. Which is the conclusion that I've come to based on the information you've provided. I thought that shit was weird from the get-go with Virginia just running to the bathroom in a department store, but then Frank can't wait like another five minutes for her to come back, so he's got to write a note for her so he can go buy fucking soda and paper cups. On their road trip, I mean, it just... It's like, just wait till she comes back out or get out of the car, lock it up, wait outside the door. When she Mm -hmm. comes out, say, hey, I wanted to grab some stuff. It's just like, from the get-go, this has been odd. Mm -hmm. But as things have progressed and got worse and worse and the statements from, you know, Ginny and the statements from Doug being so contradictory to each other, it's, I mean, how can you come to the conclusion that anything else happened to her outside of, you know, what Jenny said. Right. Outside of, you know, Frank being involved in some way, negative shape, or way. Form. Yeah, right. I agree. So, that unfortunately brings us to kind of where things stand today. And Virginia's body has never been found. Nobody has ever been charged. And quite honestly, like I said before, there really haven't been any recent updates at all in her case. And like I mentioned couple episodes back, I think, in Gary Grant Jr., that I wanted to continue doing this questions we're left with section. I think we should jump into that now. So my first question, is Frank Sr. still alive? No. Who aligns with who or like what was the family dynamic? That's like a question I have. Like, was Mm -hmm. it always, you know, Frank Sr. and Doug? Mm hmm. Frank Jr., whatever the fuck you want to call him. I know. Isn't that so strange? It is Because like I said in that Boston Globe article, it said Doug Douglas. But in the beginning, mm-hmm. there were multiple articles that said Frank Douglas Jr. And I was like, the fuck is I? But there's <laughs> only three kids. So right. I'm like, I don't understand. Yeah. It's um, with you having done this whole research yeah. portion, what questions are you left with? So one that I feel like we talked about a lot was how much blood was on the carpet that was taken from the bedroom. I think... I really want to know, but I think if I'm assuming, it probably wasn't enough to make them believe that she was killed there. Mm -hmm. More maybe just enough to know that there was something amiss. Yes, exactly. Like whether it be some sort of altercation, could have been a minor altercation, a major altercation. But clearly, if someone's not getting arrested or because how many times do people try no body homicides? It is not soup. I mean, it's rare. It's not like the most rare thing ever. So if there was enough blood to say somebody could not survive this, I think maybe charges could have been filed. So I I have a feeling that there wasn't a ton, but I still would be very curious to know how much there was. If it's like, could it be on the cusp of like, oh, this is kind of a lot, but like not enough. Or was it like just a couple droplets like you could give the excuse of maybe it was just a nosebleed? If it was a substantial amount of blood, you could have really put the heat on and been like, what the fuck happened in your house? Like, why is there all this blood? Why is your wife's hair in the door jam? All these other things and really, you know, put the full court press on him. So, yeah, I agree with that question. Like, what did the scene at the house really look like? Yeah. But, you know, what else do you have? So my next question was, why make up this elaborate story by going up to Maine? Like, what was the reason for leaving the state? 
why would you cross state lines? Why would you go to this whole hassle? What, to avoid a, an investigation in Massachusetts? I mean, it seems pretty likely that no matter what happened, because you live there, you were from there, some sort of investigation is going to take place in Mass. What the heck is the reasoning for Maine? I don't understand it. I mean, you and I would love to know, like, why he thought that would work. Yeah. But I don't think it offers enough from a prosecution standpoint. Yeah, I agree with that. So more or less, I would want to know, like, how many times did you gas up? Where did you gas up? What time did you leave X location? What time did you get to the other location? And really piece together that timeline Mm -hmm. with cold, hard, I made purchases here. This is what happened. And pick apart his yeah. story well yeah so i was gonna say like because the prosecution like if this were to ever go to trial back then like if that had happened a prosecutor could poke holes in that whole story and be like well you said this but this is what really happened you said you were here but you drove 50 miles in the other direction and gassed up there and then all of these things you poke holes in that story mm-hmm. how can you find that someone's not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt There's reasonable fucking doubt there. And when you're questioning, you know, you're you're not going hard in one direction. Mm. You have an idea of, you know. Where you want to end up. Where you want to end up and the type of information that you need to revisit it on the next interview. Agreed, yes. To see where it goes again. Mm -hmm. Not everything needs to be done at once. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, you know. Oh, what? This isn't like we're going to talk about Boo Mason and Gary Grant Jr. We're just going <laughs> to get him to confess and boom, done. Right. No, it's it's, you know, more or less. Hey, we're meeting up. Tell me about what happened. Then the next time we meet up. Well, you said you went here, but, you know, you guessed up how many times? Oh, you went here. You went there. And it's now like, he says four times instead of three. And right, now he and says, oh, the Exxon instead of the shell. Exactly. And now you're starting to say like, oh. Why is your story falling apart? These are the little details that you should know. You want to make sure if something's the truth, it doesn't matter how far in between you interview someone. Mm -hmm. They're always going to have the same story. Everything's always going to coincide. This clearly appears to be somebody that made decisions under the gun. Agreed. Yeah. I guess it kind of goes into another question of like, why? What did they not have enough of? Like, I guess maybe just a... The fact that it was a no-body homicide, it was 1988, it was probably a lot harder. And then you have to think, like, he didn't, he was 70 years old in 1988. Mm -hmm. Like, he he died within, there's no real, like, I don't know his exact death date, but he died sometime after she went missing. So you would assume probably within, like, a decade or two, you know, thinking he probably didn't live over 100. And you also got to think, too, like, when you're 70 years old, like, what the fuck's the point of killing your wife? Well, that's why I think it goes back to what Ginny said about it being an accident. He concocted this whole thing to try and cover it up. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes more sense than him setting out to do this. I completely agree. This was like a last minute. And he's like, how do I fix this? And then just explains why he didn't have a plan, Mm -hmm. why he doesn't have good answers for everything. Why he bought fucking underwear. (laughs) It's just they're trying to make these excuses and none of them are making sense. It's not a cohesive story. Right. Another question I had just had to do with, like, why the police were so convinced that none of these sightings were good sightings. Like, why were they considered tainted? And, you know, why is it to them, I guess, like, not possible to not be 100 percent sure? Like, that woman was like, no, I'm only 75 percent sure. Like, I mean, I don't think she was there. But what to them prompted them at least that early in the investigation to say, like, no, no, they're, they're not like true sightings is probably just a mistake. Like, what did they know? They had to have known more because sure, someone can have a common ap- appearance, but. I would have to assume that if they were to have like a definitive statement on something like that, like maybe when they went to do the check on her, mm-hmm. maybe they actually did a walk through the house mm-hmm. and things seemed weird and they already talked to Ginny mm. and they were in the works of that. But I mean, you got to think that investigators are not going to put all the cards on the table Right off the bat. Oh, absolutely. And that's why it's so, so hard for me, too, because I'm like, what's true? What's not? What's accurate? What's, like, everything that they have? What's, you know, just a tiny smidge of what they have? Like, and I feel like I have to really dig and try and, like, use my brain to understand why this statement is being made. Especially with a lot of the cases that we're covering, they're unsolved. hmm So in the jurisdictions in which that case resides, they're, quote, unquote, active investigations. Yep. You ain't getting shit. Nope. When it's an active investigation. 
So you're kind of at the mercy of the crumbs that they feed to the media Mm -hmm. when it was reported on, unless you can find, you know, the one odd journalist that really does their shit Mm -hmm. and goes deep into an investigation, Mm -hmm. then maybe you have a little bit more, but then it's like... Like actually talks to the people, like goes to the Rennie Shopping Plaza, talk to all the people there, like talk to the people at Friendly's, talk to them at the South Motor Inn, like doing the detective's job just as a journalist. But then you also want to be able to verify that information. Of course, yeah. And if there's only one source, can you verify it? That's tough. And then my final question was, if Frank wasn't with Virginia at the Friendlies, then who was he with? I don't know. Could have been anyone. Absolutely could have been. Very curious about that one, though. Like, why would you bring a female companion along on this journey? Or was it really Virginia? Have we misconstrued the whole thing the whole time? I mean, could it have been Virginia? Probably say doubtfully. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it could have been anyone, but I just think it... It's an interesting question to ask to say, how could someone be 75% sure it was his wife? In general, she's at least 25% sure. Well, she's 100% sure he's with somebody. Unclear exactly who that person was that he was with. But you have to think, if he's concocting this whole story, I highly, highly doubt that he's bringing somebody along with him for the journey. And then they mysteriously just disappear into nothingness, like... Right, Unfortunately, just, like Virginia did. It's like, what? So he had somebody else that disappeared with him? Like, that doesn't make sense. I think it, he would have met someone there. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense that he would bring somebody because it would be more loose ends that he would have to tie up. Yeah, exactly. There are just so many questions left unanswered. And sadly, like I said before, there have been no recent updates on the investigation into Virginia's disappearance. So these are the questions we have. But we want to know what you think. Did we miss something? Leave us a comment on our socials to let us know about your thoughts on this case. And most importantly, if you know anything about what happened to Virginia Douglas or know where her remains are located, please contact either the Maine State Police at 207-624-7143, Belfast, Maine PD at 207-338-2420, or the Lexington, Massachusetts PD at 781 862 one, two, one, two. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at wicked.deeds.podcast and on Twitter at wickeddeeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode.